And this morning we're going to be in Psalm 116. If you want to turn there, Psalm 116. There's one verse in Psalm 116 that I want to, to bring out this morning. And as you're turning there to Psalm 116, I'm going to pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this day. Jesus, we just choose to turn our spiritual eyes upon you and put all of our focus and adoration upon you as we break open the bread of life together. And Lord, as we don't want to discount or belittle the power of your word as we come into your presence, God, it is mighty. It is a sword and it's everlasting. And God, it brings to pass that which is not only your word brought into life and existence when there was nothing. Your word, you alone can make something from nothing. And God, that's what happens when we get into your word. God, you begin to breathe and illuminate and, and guide and expound. And whether it was, was nothing in our hearts or no understanding, you begin to make something. And Lord, I just thank you for your word that is with us and your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us. We love you and invite you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The, the word this morning is something you're all very familiar with in yourself and <clears throat> in your mind and in your flesh. And it's not something that will be foreign to you. And I was dwelling on it all yesterday as I was driving in Denver and sitting in a seminar. And I want to talk to you about one of the most difficult things, but one of the most necessary things in a Christian's life. A process that's as hard as nails, but many cut the process short. They, they run away. Or they neglect it so they don't have to go deep and, and experience the pain. But the process is when you accept Jesus Christ into your heart and you make him Lord of your past, present, and future, it's important that we all begin to enter in and invite and surrender the process of sanctification. Being sanctified daily by him. Now on the back wall we have the declaration of faith back there. It's our beliefs and when you look down, you go down to number six and it says that we believe in sanctification subsequent to the new birth, to being born again. You begin to enter into a life and a process of sanctification. And you look at number seven on what we believe and it says holiness before God is what he demands for his people and what we need to walk in and believe. And you can't be holy. You can't walk in holiness Unless you succumb to sanctification. Now I understand that positionally when you are born again, you're washed in the blood. He sees you covered with his son. I understand. He sees you as holy. Contrary to popular belief, I, believe, I understand that doctrine and I, I teach it. and I, That's why I'm up here. Because I receive it and I understand. I believe it. Even though we may not understand it fully, I believe that. But there's a process, isn't there? There's a sanctifying process because you and I both know you're not the same person you were as when you got saved. Some things fell off right away. You know, when he healed the blind or he touched the lame, some things were healed right away. But there was other things that took time before they slough off. It took time to walk through that. I was thinking today how there's things in my life but I was just miraculously made free from. But you know, my pride and my temper have lingered for a long time. And they still need to be sanctified. They still need to be washed. And every day we walk through that. And that's the paradox. That's the enigma. Is when we walk with Christ, you're covered in that blood. And God sees you as a finished work. But oh, that work is not finished. Right? That's sanctification. When you walk through that process. And we all have to continue into it. If we're truly His... You will go further down that road to complete and that completion, that word sanctification, it means to consecrate. And for us, it's not just one consecrate, it's consecrating. It's consecration. It goes on and on, doesn't it? 
And it's the work and the mission of God to do that in us when we're here on earth. And what he requires on our part is surrender and commitment. Because you can't sanctify yourself. I don't care how many scotch bright pads you buy and scrub yourself down all the time. You're not going to sanctify yourself from the inside out. It doesn't matter. Side note, when we were boys, we would all have to double, triple up in the shower. There was one shower and a lot of dirty boys. And my dad would yell for us to wash. Use the wash rag or I'll come in there with a wire brush and I'll rub you down. And he would say it. And for the first few years of our life, we're like, oh no, dad's going to come in with a wire brush. And then the latter years of our life, we're like, there he is again with that silly saying. But it's like that. It didn't matter if dad came in with a wire brush. He couldn't clean what was on the inside. He couldn't make his boys clean from the inside out. Only a process of sanctification does that. But the sad part is so many Christians and so many believers don't want that part. Because that's the part that hurts. That's the part that gets nitty gritty. The part that goes deep. So let's define the term. Because sanctification doesn't come by soldiering on. Sanctification comes by surrender. By surrender. So what does it mean? According to Merriam-Webster, sanctification is the state in growing in divine grace as a result of Christian commitment and conversion. So it's that state of growing in grace, being changed after you've made that conversion commitment to Jesus. It's to be set apart, sacred for a purpose. Consecrate. Now it says consecrate, and I was going, man, I don't know about you, but it wasn't one consecrate. It wasn't just one time and wham, bam, it was done. Oh, you're perfect. You know, it's like touched by an angel. I walk around the house and I just glow and I'm perfect. No, it was a process. It was a constant consecration. And every day you walk in this where there's something in you. There's something else in you that has to die. You wake up in the morning and, oh, there's an issue in my heart. There's something going on in me. There's a way I think. There's a way I act. And, boy, howdy, it needs to die. Mm -hmm. I need to die. So he can live. Sanctification, according to the Greek concordance and the lexicon, is it means purification, being purified. It's the process of being purified. It's the process of being consecrated. It's the root word is holiness. It comes from something being set apart and doesn't mean just holy. It means to make something holy. Your whole life, if you surrender to him and look to him on this earth, it would be a process of you being made holy. Less of you, more of him. How many would agree that it's a process? That it keeps going, doesn't it? Until the day you die, there's still things. And it was funny, even as I knew that this word was going to come, it was like, you know when you shine a light on a certain spot, it gets a little bit uglier, it gets a little bit easier to see. You know, when you shine a light in a dark corner and all of a sudden you see the bugs and the cobwebs that were just kind of blurry before, but you shine a light on it and it's like, ooh, that's gross. And that seemed to be what happened in the last 48 hours. You know, so you begin to shine that light. Oh yeah, sanctification is important. We need to continue. And then all of a sudden, all these weeds in my own heart kept sprouting up and I was like, there's some mortification that needs to take place in the future, isn't there? It doesn't stop. It just keeps going. And the key scripture that I have you had you turn to is in Psalm 116. And go to verse 8. In Psalm 116, verse 8. And the psalmist says, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, and my, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. And I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, therefore I have spoken. I was greatly afflicted, and I said in my haste, All men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for his benefits toward me? I'll take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord, and I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now look how he starts in Psalm 116, verse 8. He says, For you've dis- delivered my soul from death. And look how he ends in verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is death. Of his saints. That's the enigma. That's the, that's the amazing thing. Where he translates you from light to dark. He takes you from death to life. And then. 
a crucifixion, a dying, a mortification, a purification, a to be made holy, a sanctification process begins to take you to death again. You see, there is no life in Christ without death. You have to die first. And that process takes a long time in life, doesn't it? Let's make it more clear. Because what could be more precious to God is watching His people die to flesh and die to self and begin to look more like His Son. That's precious in the eyes of the Lord. The death of His saints. The constant death and putting to death the things in you. That sanctifying process is so important. And you know what? I, I don't want to overemphasize or get too dramatic this morning. I'm not dramatic at all. I'm never dramatic. But I don't want to overemphasize the fact that that's one thing that you do not see today. You see lots of people, they go to church and there's people that profess Christianity. But when it comes to the mortification of the things of the flesh and walking a life of being sanctified, being changed, constantly choosing to lay things down at his feet and surrender, that is not something that's common. Even though it is something that was necessary and nothing could be more common to those that really love him and really want to walk with him. You see that gap? That we want to be called by his name, we want to enter in, we want paradise, but I want to skip over the entire sanctification process and be, be translated like Enoch or like Elijah, home. But I don't want that process because that process is where the rubber meets the road and where all the steel gets put in your backbone. In Colossians chapter 3, the first verse, it says, If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. He says, set your affections on the things above, not things of the earth, for you're dead. You're dead, you're dead, you're dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. For when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Mortify, kill, let die the things in your flesh, in your body, which are on the earth. All the things of the flesh, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things, these things, the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. For in which ye were also walked in some time when you lived in them. But you put off these things now. You put off all the anger and the wrath and the malice and the blasphemy. The evil communication. The bad language out of your mouth. You don't lie to each other seeing you've put off the old man. Meaning you've crucified the old man. You've killed the old man. You've mortified the old man. And you're being sanctified. You've put on a new man. Which is renewed in the knowledge. That concept of being renewed means being sanctified. You're constantly being changed and washed into the image of Him that created you. After the image of Him that created Jesus. Jesus wasn't created. But the one that came on earth and that Jesus even walked through a process of suffering and learning obedience. That process that Jesus had on earth is the illumination, it's the analogy, it's the allegory of what we walk through in life. Jesus grew and he learned and he suffered and he became more obedient. He says he learned obedience, subjection to the Father. It was a process. Jesus didn't have to be sanctified, but it says he learned and he grew. And it's the same in you and I. And then he goes on in Romans chapter 8, verse 10, and Paul says, And if Christ is in you, the body's dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Jesus from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwells in you. That brings about change. Therefore, we're debtors not to the flesh to live after flesh. For if you live after flesh, you'll die. But if you through the spirit mortify, Be sanctified. Be washed and cleansed daily of the deeds of the body. You'll live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. And we've not received a spirit of bondage to fear, but we've received the spirit of adoption where we cry, Abba, Father. Did you hear that word mortify? Mortify. You know, it's some very intense 
graphic language, mortify the things of the flesh, and it's intense imagery from the Holy Spirit that those things have to die. I know that there is nothing. Let me be very PG about this. There is nothing as foul as when you find a person or a carcass that is being mortified. There is no smell like that on the planet. And it, even though you have a stuffy nose, even though you have a cold, you seem to know that smell and pick it out. Being mortified. And that's why he uses that kind of language because the flesh and the deeds of the flesh and the, what we're born into is ugly and it's wicked and it's wretched. But when you're translated from dark to life, when you come from dark to light, from death to life, that's when that sanctification subsequent to new birth begins. You see, the people in the world that are walking around with a big cloud over their head and darkness and deceit, there's no sanctifying process in their life. They're just going around and around the toilet bowl until they end up down the drain. That's all it is, round and around. But when you are translated and you're given that robe of righteousness and washed in that blood, it's almost like the Holy Ghost goes like this. And the sanctification begins. The process starts. And like I said, some things fall off right away. But some things, man, he's got to get out the, the 80, 60 grit sandpaper right away. And it hurts. And he starts rubbing hard. And then there's things that you will hide away in your life and you don't want the sandpaper to touch it because it hurts. So you lock it in a, in a room with a deadbolt or you put it in a corner and you pretend it's not there. But after the fine sandpaper is hit everywhere else, then the Holy Spirit decides, hey, that room you have locked, I got to get a chisel because it's been there so long. We can't even use sandpaper on that thing now. I got to get a hammer and a chisel, so get it out. It's time to do business. And that's the dangerous part. That's when you find out if you're surrendered or submitted or you're not. God is so gracious. He'll keep going to that door over and over again. Let me get it out. Let me deal with it. Let me deal with it. This is the process you signed up for. This is making you into my image. Don't hold. Don't recoil. Just give it to me. Just surrender and we'll deal with it. I'll make you like me. But that's where you find out where your allegiance lies. And that's where I found out where so many friends and family members, whether they're really willing to go the distance or not. This is where people fall away. This is where people begin to drift away from Christ. I would venture, this is not gospel truth, this is my opinion, but it's based on experience, it's based on the Word of God, it's based on what I've seen, but it's still my opinion. That those that float away from the Lord... Those that no longer walk with Him. It's because they had issues that they refused to let God deal with. Amen. They refused to be sanctified. You can have every other portion, but don't touch this. Don't touch this. And when God keeps reaching for it, they keep trying to slap His hand. Don't touch that in my life. You can't have that part. And God goes, I'm trying to sanctify you. You don't understand. You think it's for your hurt, but it's for your good. This is for life. So you can have life. You could be sanctified and experience life. But what you're doing is it's a cancer that's going to bring forth death if you don't deal with it. And I would be, I would admit that I'm wrong, but I don't think I am, that you'd be able to trace back on all those people that are hard or bitter, or people that have left churches, or people that don't want to hear anything about God anymore. And you can trace it back to where God was trying to put his finger on something. Let's sanctify this. And they said, no, no. And they walk and they begin to turn and they begin to defend themselves. And I want you to touch that. But that is what sanctification is. You and I have tried to do this in your own strength. I have an issue, I have a struggle, I have something that needs to change. So I'll fix it. I'll fix it. It cannot be done. It doesn't happen. You don't make yourself holy. Only God makes men and women of God. When you pursue Him, it's not pursuit that I'm going to fix it. 
It's pursuit of I will completely lean on the arm and the power of the Lord to transform me, to sanctify me. I trust him to do it. Even though you have all the filth that keeps bubbling up, and you keep having to deal with it. It's you take it to him and you lay at his feet and you keep coming and say, you said you'd deal with it. You said you'd work on it. I lay it at your feet. You can have it. Deal with it. Even though I keep maybe falling into it or I keep acting a certain way or saying a certain way or treating this person a certain way or having these same thoughts or having these same temptations or these same tendencies. It's not that you can't touch it. It's please just deal with it. I can't do it. You do it. That's sanctification. That's the process. And it's the process that so many don't want to have because you think it's just getting rid of things that you don't like. Sometimes God needs to get rid of things that you really like. And your flesh really likes. Sometimes God has to get rid of things that you really like. Did you get it? That you really like. And he has to say, "Mm -mm. we're going to deal with that. We're going to. We're going to moderate. And your flesh will writhe and squirm. But you know it's for my life. And that transformation comes through him and by him. It's been said that the wheels of grace turn slow, but sure. They're sure. Can I give you an example of what our heart is like? What the process of sanctification is like? This is one of my most favorite stories. It's a true story. Malcolm Muggeridge was a journalist and became an apologist in the early mid 1900s. Well, he was working as a journalist in India and he left his residence one evening to go to a nearby river in India to swim. As he entered the water, across the river he saw an Indian woman from a nearby village who had come to bathe. Mugridge impulsively felt the allurement of the moment, and temptation stormed into his mind when he beheld this naked silhouette of a woman. He had lived with this kind of struggle for years, but somehow he fought it off, but in honor of his commitment to his wife. But on this occasion, he wondered if he could cross the line of fidelity. He struggled for a moment, but then he swam furiously across the river. He came to the woman. He was literally trying to outdistance his conscience as he swam so fast to get to her. His mind fed him the fantasy that stolen waters would be sweet, and he swam harder after this woman. Now, when he was just two or three feet away from her, he emerged from the water. Any emotion that gripped him paled into insignificance compared with the devastation that shattered him as he looked on her. She was old and hideous, And her skin was wrinkled, and worst of all, she was a leper. He said, this creature grinned at me, and she had no teeth. And she was eaten with leprosy. He said, it left me trembling and muttering. He said, what a dirty, lecherous woman. But he said, the rude shock dawned on me as I turned away. What a lecherous heart I have. That's the process of sanctification. You see the allurement of something. I don't want you to touch this. You can't have this. And what you're keeping, what you're holding on to, is just leprosy. It's just wickedness. It's filth. And it contaminates your being. You see, his heart was so deceiving him. If you can't have this thing, you won't be satisfied. You have to pursue this. The lust of your flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And the wonderful thing about this is it's a true story. It really happened. You can read his, his account of this happening. But what God did is he peeled back his heart and showed him his own heart. You have to be sanctified. You have to be changed. You have to grow. In James, we had a Bible study in James months ago. But in James it says... Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he's tried, he will receive the crown of life. Let no man say when they're tempted, I'm tempted of God, because God can't be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt with evil. But every man is tempted when they're drawn away by their own lust. And when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. Death. 
I often think about all the allurement of the world, all the gravitational pull of, of sin and flesh, how people rush to entertainment and, and money and notoriety and fame and acceptance. And I have to have the coolest car, the coolest clothes. I have to be liked. But everything in the world and of the world and of the flesh, what is the end thereof? Just death. Just death. You can't take it with you. And that's the conversation I've been having with my pre-adolescent daughters who are coming into, I can't even say it or I'll flip out, you know, are starting to become little women and starting to want to put on all kinds of makeup and clothes and keep hammering into their brains. It doesn't matter what other people think of you. It doesn't matter what your friends think, if they think you're smart or pretty. All that matters is what you are before him when nobody's looking. It's all that matters. Friends will come and go. Look at my daughter's honey. I don't even remember my friends when I was your age. They are long gone. Many of them are in jail and across the earth. I, I don't even remember. The people you're trying to impress, it doesn't matter. It's your whole world right now. But it really doesn't matter. What matters is the end goal that you would impress him. And it says in Titus, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. This is Titus chapter 2. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world. And he says, he who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all sin and purify, purify unto himself a particular people zealous for good works. He's talking about denying that, those things of the flesh and being purified. And he says at the end, these things speak and exhort. He's telling Titus, don't forget to talk about this, that the things of the flesh have to die. You have to remember. You have to walk in it. You have to be purified. It's a process to walk with Him. It's a real problem. It's a real epidemic in the world we live in. You know, even when we had a more moral-ish society 50, 60, 70 years ago, there was things that people just seemed to innately know was wrong. You just don't talk that way. You don't act that way. You just don't do that. You don't do that. And if you do, it needs to change. That is so gone from the mentality and the society we're in now. Everything goes. And if you judge what I say, how I look and what I do, you're the problem. You're the bigot. You're the intolerant one. You're the one that's narrow-minded. If you judge my filth that I want to rub all over you. Isn't it amazing how that whole shift has changed now. Now it's no longer there's things you just don't do, you just don't say. You know, I have to, and with a Christian, it's I have to be sanctified. Those things have to go. I have to change. But now it's we want to wear all the filth and all the smut and all the scum on the outside and we want to flip it and wipe it all over everybody around us. That's what the society does. That's what most teenagers and, and 20s and 30 year olds do now. You can't tell me that I can't try to make you look at all my sin and accept my sin. And even Christians are like that. And I'm sorry, I am not picking on people. Hear my heart here. I promise you, I promise you, I'm not judging people. I'm not judging them. I don't know what happened when they were saved or what kind of teaching they had. But it is one of my pet peeves when you have people that are walking with the Lord and everything begins to expose itself on their skin and through piercings and colors and everything begins to come out on the outside. Now, I don't mind. If you're, conv if you're not convicted and you want to do that, fine. But what I do understand according to the word is what's in here will come out here. Yes. What you want to look like, who you want to be like, will come out. And it will manifest itself in many ways. And it's always bothered me when I look at people that I'm just going, what is God doing on the inside of you? 
What is he speaking on the inside of you that so much would be on the outside? I don't understand. And like I said, I'm not judging people and people want to throw stones at me. And I'm not, I'm not saying that those things in themselves are evil. But isn't, I always look at them and say, isn't the highest goal just to walk, talk, and act like him? Don't you just want to look like him? You call yourself by his name, but then you want to look like everybody in the world. That comes from a heart of love, I swear. I promise. And he says to exhort and speak these things. Be sanctified. That sanctification, that process, is not just for the outside. It starts to happen on the outside. I mean, it's not just for the inside. It starts to happen on the outside, too. You start getting convicted in how you wear. I mean, girls don't walk around wearing mini skirts with their chests falling out, come to church after they get saved. God begins to do a work. They may for a week or two when they don't know any better. But then God and the Holy Ghost begins to do a work and he begins to sanctify the outside too, doesn't he? Because God's not finished. He begins to do I don't walk into church in my muscle shirts going like this. You all would be so impressed. Why? Because he's, he's doing a work in my heart. You don't do that, okay? You just don't do that. I'm going I'm to sanctify you inside and out. God doesn't love those people any less. He doesn't have any less of a plan for them. And you know what? We don't look at those people and judge them because I look at them with spiky blue hair and piercings everywhere and their whole face is metal and they got tattoos even on their fingernails. And I say, oh, they're in a process. They're just in a process. God's doing a process. It just takes time. I don't judge him. I know God will do it. He'll do it. I don't care. Do whatever you want. Dye your hair whatever color you want. But 10, 20 years from now, it probably won't be that color. God will do a process in you. He'll do a work in you. He'll change you. He'll begin to change your desires because he's faithful to do it. But that's the problem we have. And God's been dealing with me for a week about all these flies in my ointment. All these things in my life. You don't want me to touch that. You want to neglect that? Well, I'm asking you for it. Give it to me. And you can't help but say, okay. What am I going to do? Hold back. Am I going to stifle the anointing and stymie the process because of my heart? Can't. Time's too short. Too many people are dying and going to hell for me to dig my heels in like a stubborn donkey. You see, maximum potential and use is only gained and attained by those that give over to a sanctifying process in submission and surrender. The maximum use of your life, the most that God can gain through using you is only attained by you submitting to that process. By you saying, okay, Lord, do it. God is faithful. God has a plan. He will always achieve his purposes. But I have watched people dig their heels in and drag it out. When God wants to do something. God wants to change something. And I know that my God made many great and precious promises for me that he'll redeem time. Because many times I drug my heels. He was trying to deal with something I didn't want it done and it took longer than it should have and I didn't surrender and I put my trust. Oh, God, redeem the time when I was an idiot. Redeem the time when I was so stubborn and I didn't see what you're trying to do in my life. I don't need to give you examples of today of friends, of family or people that you've seen that refuse to walk through that process because those that are recorded in the word and those that we see, they neglect and they resist that holy calling to die and be sanctified. And their figurative tombs are all over the wilderness, aren't they? They die. They fall away. How dangerous, how important, how serious we should see the necessity of our part in sanctification, which means surrendering and allowing it. When he saves you, he's definitely strong enough, and I believe he can keep you. When God saves you, God can keep you. When God saves you, God can preserve you. 
No matter what you walk through, there's no fear of falling away or God forsake me. He's promised that he'll keep you. But I've seen many that did not want to be kept. I've seen many that didn't want the protection and didn't want it. They were like Esau. They traded the inheritance, they traded the birthright, they traded the future just for a little fleeting pleasure of the moment, for the sin, for the flesh. And where did it get them? Where did it leave them? I cry over them. Friends that I've known and loved ones that have just refused to let God keep them. Such a blessing, such a gracious gift that God gives us free will. But what a dangerous thing if you don't lay that free will at his feet. He's given us a free will to make decisions and do things and go here and go there and do what we think is best in certain situations. But how dangerous is that free will all across this planet when it's not surrendered and given to him? There's a lot of things I could do that I think are good. But what I have just ashes up to my ankles, maybe, if God doesn't say, hey, this is probably what you should do. If I don't take my free will and submit it to him, that's danger. Walking our own path when he constantly beckons us to be sanctified at his feet. Sanctification starts and ends with his presence. That's why he looked at Mary and he said, Mary's chosen the better part to sit at my feet. Martha, you're so busy. You're so worried. You're doing so much. The sanctification, the process doesn't happen in the kitchen. It happens at my feet. It happens by my presence. And I know this word can come across as heavy. It can come across as having weight. And it is not meant to condemn. It's meant to remind us of the truth that he's called us. He's told us. Enter into this life of being sanctified, being cleansed, being washed, every day being changed. What is the greatest, one of the greatest testimonies of a believer that was a wretch and that was lost and that was this ugly, dirty, rotten, foul scoundrel and then somebody meets them after they're saved and looks at them and says, I remember you. And you, you can look him in the eye or that person looks him in the eye and say, no, you don't because you've never met this person. You've never met me. I'm totally different. Or you don't even say a word. And that person looks at them and says, man, there's something different about you. You've changed. That's because God's sanctifying me. He's changing me. I've had the pleasure of that happening to me a few times. One story, I had a friend growing up, he was Catholic. He was a very staunch Catholic, very, very Italian, and grew up in an Italian family. He was a Catholic family. I lived across the street. We were best friends growing up. We spent a lot of time with each other. And as we grew up, we started going our separate ways, and we were going to different high schools. He moved away across the country, and then he went to Indonesia, and his dad traveled for work. And Many, many years later, after I was in Bible school, I ended up meeting him again. And I felt the Holy Spirit in me saying, you need to tell him about me. Tell him about me. Don't be a coward. Tell him. And I noticed there was something different about him. He wasn't the same. There was a, there was a presence about him. There was a peace. There was an understanding. He, uh, I think he was married at this time. But there was something different about him. And I just looked at him and said, man, he's changed. And before I could get the words out of my mouth, he said, when I was in college, I was born again. He said, I received Christ as my Savior. I'm a Christian now. And that light bulb went off in my head and said, that's what it is. He's changed. There's something different about him. And I've had that happen in my life where there's people that you, you see or you come across and you notice the change in them. And you know that that change was not achieved by self-help books or pills or gurus. 
or no matter how many times they washed themselves or tried to chant or mantras to change what was on the inside, God did it. They were in a process, and they're still in that process of being changed. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. That's like us. When you are translated into the kingdom, you're put to death in the flesh, but then you're quickened or made alive in the spirit. And then God begins that process. That process of the word doing a work in you and changing you. God leading you. When you walk with him where he leads, you are with the sanctifier. When you're in his presence and you're with him, you're with he who does the sanctifying. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the, le- the, the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, and they're contrary to one another. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And why should we be led by the Spirit? Because the Spirit will lead us in a sanctification in that process. The Spirit will, He came to reveal the things of Jesus. He came to speak of Jesus. He came to reveal Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is part and works in that process. The Trinity works in that process in you and I, that sanctification process. It's hard, but it's important. 